just real quick as a reminder, if you didn't have cash or, uh, and you want to support, again, in your bulletins, uh, there's the, the Gideon handout. You can tear this off and put credit information, and then Jim, just give it to Jim directly, or uh, who else is here from the Gideons? Raise your hand. Huh? Jeff Flagg. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, he's here somewhere. The guys that are dressed in suits, give it to them. We allowed them to come with suits this morning. Also, as you're turning there, we just want to make mention a, 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 that um, Jenny Martinez has been approved for American citizenship, and we want to give her a congratulations. And of course, she's, not, she's here, so tell her congratulations. We'll let you know when the ceremony is and all that, and then uh, have her, uh, we'll, we'll bless her again. And then uh, yesterday, Violet Bennett is, went home after heart surgery. And uh, so just keep her in prayer. You know, she's home now. She asked where she wants to be. And she's a, a sweet lady, a saint, and a, uh, just a, a, a blessing to be here at Calvary Chapel, her and her husband. Also, uh, my son-in-law, Callum, has graduated from Army basic training. There a lot of prayer went into that. And when he comes, we'll, we'll uh, acknowledge him and bless him. And also, two of the Kreider girls are currently in Navy boot camp, so keep them in prayer. What's the names? Uh, Miranda, or what's the name? Minda and, and Becca. Minda and Becca are in Navy boot camp, so if you've ever been through boot camp, you know they need prayer as well. So we prayed for Callum a lot. My knees are hurting, but anyway, he made it, so praise God. Well, let's turn our Bibles, as I said, to Galatians chapter 2. The church at Antioch, as we mentioned, was a model um, for Jewish-Gentile integration, and that is into Christianity. It was a wonderful model of what God had put together through his plan of salvation. And it was all based upon grace alone and Christ alone. And in our text, we have seen how that could be damaged based upon the hypocrisy of Peter, the error of doctrine. When error comes into the church, bad doctrine, bad thoughts, man's, you know, man's thoughts going into what God has planned out and trying to change things. We find out that when this takes place and what Peter did through his hypocrisy that led the rest of those of the Jewish descent, separating themselves from the Gentiles when the Jewish legalists came down from Jerusalem. They felt this peer pressure, they felt this heritage pressure, and then they began to just separate themselves. And Paul, because it was a public error, corrected Peter publicly in front of all of them to not only speak into Peter, but to the rest of them who, hypocri- who, who brought forth this hypocrisy, knowing that what they did was wrong. By the way, Peter accepted this public correction, knowing what he did was wrong. He, he wasn't upset with Paul, for there in his own writings in 2 Peter 3, and you can read it later in the 15th and 16th chapter, Peter calls Paul a beloved brother a man full of wisdom. So this is a a, a great uh, instance where correction brought about great humiliation and acceptance and recovery from what could be a very bad way and a bad doctrine that could creep in and was trying to get and, and was creeping in through the Judaizers into the church that it was before them. In order to review what we've studied, let's begin reading in verse 11, but we pick it up in verse 17 where we'll expound on that. But let's roll back to verse 11 so some of you who weren't here can get the whole just of what I just have been explaining. Verse 11, now when Peter had come uh, to Antioch, again the hub, the, the main hub of the Jewish Gentile integration of the church there in Asia Minor, I got to stop teaching because I don't have time to go into it. But I withstood him, Paul says, to his face because he was to be blamed. 
For before certain men came from James, that is from Jerusalem, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, these Jews, these legalists, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Guys, we only need to fear God. And when we fear and reverence God, we don't have to worry about other people. We don't have to worry what others think. Our fear for God, our love, our respect, our honor for God will show through our character, through our behavior. But here we see that he feared man. 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. His fear led others to play the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature, Paul says, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be what? But if, and here we go, this is where we pick it up this morning. But if, we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Please read verses 19 and 20 out loud with me. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Father, would you please speak to us this morning? Go beyond my notes, God. Thank you for the time that I have spent in your word. Thank you for speaking to me individually. Now, will you do the same, Lord? We know you will here in this congregation. Will you speak to us individually and corporately, God? For we need you desperately, Lord. We want to walk straight forward, Lord, in the truth of the gospel, not sidestepping. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, once again... We see here that Paul is continuing this public correction. Uh, he don't think he's doing it in a, in a, in a mean demeanor or a, a, a way of where he's just cutting pe Peter down. For he speaks to us and he'll teach us how we are to correct a brother and a sister uh, in the faith. And to bring them back on track or to remind them or to correct their error. He says in verse 6, 17, that if we as the Jews seek and know and desire because the truth to be justified, to be right with God by Christ, we know that to be true. That's what we desire. That's what we believe. That is our doctrine. For those of us Jews, for those of us of the Jewish descent who seek this, that we ourselves then are found to be sinners. Now, what's he saying here? Well, knowing that Christianity is not based on works, nor upon legal statutes, but all upon what Jesus did on the cross, yet accepting that we are still sinners in need of obeying the requirements of the law or adding to what Christ had already done, which is circumcision, dietary do's and don'ts, based on that lie that what Jesus did for us did not complete the work of sanctification, well, then the fact would be that Paul and the rest of the believing Jews are also found sinners, guilty because they have abandoned the law for grace. Or I should say they have abandoned grace 
for law. That's, that's what I meant to say. This thinking can only result in the question that Paul makes next. If that is true, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Is Christ who completed the work on the cross, fulfilling all the requirements of the law, whom himself said of himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me, through all that I have done. Therefore, is he a minister of sin? And Paul gives the right and the only response. Certainly not. And friends, that is the strongest response in the negative that you'll ever find in the Greek language. It means God forbid. It is strong. He says, certainly not. Far be it. God forbid. Paul would also write in Acts 13, he says, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man who's speaking of Jesus is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul says we know this, but if we're going to embrace law again, if we're going to add these, these uh, you know, statutes to it, then you're calling Jesus a minister of sin because we're still in our sin. We're still, we haven't embraced the completion in Christ. And he's trying to get this across not only to Peter, but he's trying to get it across to the rest of the group there. Understand what you guys are doing and the danger of what you're portraying before these Gentiles and how this could spread, as I said the other day, the other time, like wildfire. Then he gives a logical explanation. He just says simply, for if I build again, in other words, if I build upon a foundation laid by others, is what that word means. If I build again, and those others, of course, in context, is the Judaizers, this hybrid kind of Christianity that they brought in, Jesus and the law. If I build again those things, the doctrine of the Judaizers, which I destroyed, which I demolished, is that what that word means, uh, figuratively, by preaching Christ alone for salvation and for justification. Then I put myself back under the law, Paul says. I make myself a transgressor because I know the truth of sanct- sanct- justification through Christ, sanctification, justification through Christ. I know that. But in knowing that, if I start to build upon what I destroyed, what I preach against now, what I warn people of, if I do that, I become a transgressor. That's parabates. And it means one who steps over the line. It's a word that speaks of knowing what is sinful and willfully stepping into it. Knowing that it's sinful for me to go into the stop and rob and rob it. 7 Eleven. Stop and go. And knowing that, oh, I like ho-hos. Is that what they're called? Because I do like them. But I don't want to pay for it. But I know if I don't pay for it, it's against the law. It's all right. I'm going to take it anyway. And you walk out. That's transgression. That's stepping over the line. That's sinful and willful stepping into it, as I like to call it. If a sinner is compared to one who misses the mark, and we all do, then a transgressor is one who intentionally aims outside of the mark off the target. He's not even trying. He's just... see. We, in our walk, you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by, by the best of our ability, we want, to, we want to hit the target. We want to hit the bullseye, right? And sometimes we miss. And that's what that word sin, sin means. But transgressor is another word. And that's one who intentionally aims outside. Paul is telling Peter this. If a person sets out to build or rebuild something that he once deemed fit only for demolition, the message that you're going to be communicating, and you have communicated, Peter, is that 
he has made a mistake, that you have made a mistake. And the Gentiles are watching, and the church is watching. Well, wait a minute. That's a different message that Paul is teaching. Did Paul make a mistake? Peter, are you making a mistake in saying that justification comes only through Jesus Christ and him alone by grace, by faith, through faith? Paul says, Peter, you got to understand what you're doing in this hypocrisy, in this separation. Peter, by your hypocrisy toward the Gentiles, you are sending the message that justification by grace through faith alone is a mistake. And by keeping the law and being, becoming circumcised and abstaining from certain foods is the right way. Guys, we got to be careful with our witness. We got to be careful. We got to walk pure. We got we to walk right. We got to ask the Holy Spirit to empower us, to help us, to get us through the day because there are always eyes on us. And we are portraying to the world who Christ is. We are an open book. We are a paragraph. We are the continuation of Acts. And people are looking at us, whether you like it or not. We represent, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And Peter, man, you're messing up, dude. And then Paul gives his personal testimony. And I ask you to read verses 19 and 20 because if you notice there, there are eight personal pronouns. I and me. He says, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. Paul is saying that the law slayed me. He, he's saying, I, I, I died to the law. The, laws, the law slayed me, but the Lord saved me. Yeah. Hashtag MDR, man. Write that down. That's going to be famous one day. I'm not going to say it again, but it's awesome. But the law tells us that there's no one what? No one righteous. You can't meet it. You, you, you can't, you, you'll never be able to meet the law's requirements. It ministers the death penalty for Jew and Gentile alike. It ministers and tells us you are slayed. You are, you are dead. Romans 3.20 Paul writes, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, in God's sight. For by the law is the, what? Knowledge of sin. Is the knowledge of sin. But now, praise God for the but now, the righteousness of God apart from the law, apart from the legal relationship one once had with God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the Bible pointed to this coming justification, to this coming one who would justify us and save us and cleanse us and wash us, even the righteousness of God, through works. No, through faith, right? In Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe. You couldn't get any clearer than that, folks. The law was given to reveal sin, not to give life. The law was given to bring the knowledge of sin, and it was given to reveal death. The law brings me to the grave. The law brings the fear in my life and the fear of the grave, but it cannot bring an assurance of the resurrection. So the law brings me to the grave. And that's all it can take me to. But Jesus Christ brings me from the grave into the resurrected life. Only Jesus can do that. Paul says that I might live to God. All of this so I may live to God. Once a man is dead, the law has no power over him. And once I come to realize that through my salvation in Christ, I can live to God. I live to God. Until he calls me home. If a robber, let me just put it this way. If somebody go, has been, again, the guy from 7-Eleven, we're stopping Rob, he gets busted. And he goes, gets placed in the Rappahannock jail and, and he waits for his court and he's found guilty. And now he, they put him in that, 
that bus, that, that van, and they're, they're taking him for his, to court for his sentence, sentencing, and all of a sudden he dies. Let's see, he just has a heart attack. He dies in transport. The law he broke has no more power over him. He's dead. What are they going to do, bring in the corpse? Would you please stand that corpse up so I can give him his sentencing? You know, Bernie, he's dead. <laughs> Death nullifies all charges and its punishment. So too with us, when we realize that we are dead to the law, and before our sentencing are the judgment of seat, and it's coming, folks. The judgment seat is there before our sentencing at the judgment seat when we find new life, when we accept Christ as our Savior, as Jim clearly preaches constantly and shares Christ because there is a sentencing to come. Before that comes, when we accept the new life through a relationship with Jesus, we are now no longer guilty under the law. Jesus has taken our sentence. Jesus has taken our penalty. We will never stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now we will go before the Bema seat of Christ, where there we will be given rewards. You need to know that. When we realize that we are dead to the law, we too now become alive to God and live for God and his will in my life to live to God. Live to God, Christian. Live to God. It's a great life, man. We're not perfect. We still miss the mark. But we go and we confess to him. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He's a good God, man. He says in verse 20, continuing with these pronouns, with his personal witness, not only is he correcting, or we could even say rebuking Peter and the group, doing it in a, in a gentle way, but he's giving him a, a witness, a reminder, a personal reminder. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Listen, I have been, that those three words, in the Greek, they're perfect tense. And it speaks of a once and for all action. I have been once and for all crucified with Christ. No one can take that away from me. I have been crucified with Christ. Jesus died for me, and he died as me, taking my place and bearing my sin. And he gives me new life. It is no longer, he says, I, the old man. Or the old woman. I'm sorry, but you know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> it is no longer the old, go talk to the old man. It is no longer the old man. When, when Dorothy says, go talk to the old man, he says, that old man don't live here, so I ain't got no money for you. <laughs> the old man, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I become a, a new man. You become a new woman. The old have passed away. The new becomes great, comes forth. And the life which I now live in the flesh, the body where my spirit and soul inhabits, I live, again, I live. That word I live is a verb. It is in the perfect tense indicating a past completed action, listen, that has continuing results. I live because of what Jesus did on Calvary for what Christ did coming out of the tomb and the resurrection day. That power, that statement, that event, that death, that life, I live. A past completed action that has continuing, continuing results by faith in the Son of God. Why do the Gideons keep going out and giving the gospel? Because it's a continuing result. It's a continuing action, power, truth that's still valid today for every breathing soul until they take their last breath. And this speaks of our, this speaks of identity. Listen, folks, here's application. Paul speaking of his identity. I'm comfortable with my identity. I'm comfortable being a Christian. He says, I identify with Christ. He died for me. He died 
as me on the cross. I live. I have a new identity. Identity in Christ. Listen, the world, the three, right? The world, Satan, and my, our flesh, ourselves, our minds sometimes will hunt us in order to condemn us and blur our Christ identity, our Christian identity. It tries to blur it out of the way. It tries to get you to think, yeah, I am no good. I, I, how can I get involved with church? If people knew the things that I do, if people knew the things that I think, if people, you know, the enemy comes in and he begins to condemn you. Your flesh condemns you. Your past, can, don't let it. That's the old man. Bury the old man and stop going back to the graves of lust, the graves of the past. Sometimes we do that. We're out there digging the old man up, man. That was fun that one time. I want to get that back. I can't get that. I'm trying to get that high back. I'm trying to get that lust back. I'm trying. I'm, and we, get, we find ourselves at the graves. No, drop, the, drop it. Don't listen to the enemy. Don't listen to what the world tells you. All it does is condemn us. We must remember you're a child of the God. You're, you're, you're a child of the Lord. Uh, uh, Romans 8, there is no, therefore now no what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He says, it is no longer I, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love this. See, guys, love gives. Love does not take. Love gives. Love is gentle and kind. Love doesn't hurt. Love doesn't bring pain. And love, love always gives. And as we commemorate Memorial Day tomorrow, again, as has been said, we know that many have given the ultimate sacrifice. That's what Memorial Day is. They've been given the, they've given the ultimate sacrifice to save others. They've been given the ultimate sacrifice in defense of America. They've been given the ultimate sacrifice in defense of others the, in country where they have been there, you know, serving. And we have memorials to remind us of these battles. My brother-in-law, Dorothy's brother, is on the wall at, in D.C. on the Vietnam Wall and also in the hometown of Garden Grove, California. His name is there. It's, we have memorials to remind us of these battles and the great bravery of these men and women in uniform. Somebody said, tomorrow's not a day off, it's a day on. On your knees and remembering those. But the cross is the Christian's memorial. A memorial that continues to have the power, as we said earlier, that continues on in the power and in the result and in the purpose for mankind. Communion is the Christian sacrament in remembering the greater sacrifice that gives to us life. And no greater sacrifice has been given than when Christ was there on the cross laying down his life from all mankind. We're hearing Paul now in his Closing remarks, and in our closing remarks, he says, listen, guys. He says, I do not set aside, that is to reject, to cast off the grace of God. And Peter, when you separated yourself from, from the church, from these Gentiles, that's exactly what you did. You cast yourself off. You made them look like second-class people. You, you rejected them. You rejected grace because of these legalists who have come down from Jerusalem as you have come down to see what is going on 
with this integration of Jews and Gentiles in what today we call the church. He says, I, I, I do not set aside, I do not reject, I do not cast off the grace of God. God is not a minister. Jesus is not a minister of sin. That is not what he is. He has come to free us from sin, to cleanse us from sin. He says, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. That word means without cause for no reason. In vain. He was a good man. He did some good things. As I think Lewis, C.S. Lewis says, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And liar and lunatic means vain. But no, we know him as Lord. Amen? And those who try to earn God's favor by their own effort are telling God that his son died unnecessarily. And that's a, that's a true charge. I've got friends who still live under the law or try to. There are denominations that have embraced themselves as the true church. And their water, I don't know what kind of filter they have, is the only water that you can be baptized in. Their denomination is the only denomination that you need to join and be a member and give your finances to in order to get saved. There is bad doctrine out there, friends. You need to know the word of God. You need to filter it through the word. Paul will not relent in his public correction towards Peter or anyone else who gets in the way with the exhibited behavior of segregation based upon law over grace. He will not stand for it. He is in the ring. He is fighting and defending the faith. And he'll go toe-to-toe. He'll go toe-to-toe with anyone, including the Pope. Jokingly, including Peter. He is not a respecter of persons because God is not either. For it shouts, Christ died in vain. And we know that that is not true. That is not true. Jesus is alive, but are you alive in Christ? These are things that we must come away with this morning. Have you died to self in order to live for Christ? These are things that we need to contemplate this morning from these verses. Again, it's not based upon merit. It's not based upon how many stars you have on the refrigerator. Now, parents keep doing that because that encourages your children. But for salvation, it doesn't matter how many stars you have. It doesn't matter how many people you have in your congregation as a pastor or elders. It doesn't matter how many people that you've led to Christ or it doesn't matter how many people you've baptized. What matters is just the fact as you accepted Christ as your Savior. It's what Jesus has done for you by his love in making making us a new man or a new woman. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Praise God. Team can come up. We even have time to do one last song. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us this time. We pray continually for the Gideons, God, who do a good work for you, who, who, under the inspiration now of the Holy Spirit, and you have called us to good works, but it's not work that saves us, but it's the work that comes out of our relationship with you, God, to exercise our gifts, to exercise your love, to to be obedient to your great commission. So we thank you so much for that, God. Help us, Lord. You know we struggle with the flesh and the spirit every day, God. And we just need your empowerment. Thank you for loving us, Lord. If no one has said this morning, if no one has said this week that, hey, you know what? I love you. We know you have. You're, you're, you're our greatest lover, our best fan, Lord. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name. Now listen, if you're here, you never accepted Christ as your Savior. We got some Gideons here. We've got a prayer team here. And you can give your life this morning. And you're welcome to come and pray with the prayer team. Or maybe you're struggling this morning. And it's just a struggle where the enemy says, you're in the net. 
and you can't get out. That's a lie. Don't believe that. Whether it's anger or lust or whether it's anything else, maybe, it, maybe, maybe those prescription drugs have just got the best of you. It's time to come forward for prayer and ask, ask the prayer team. God knows the details. Just pray for me. You don't even have to mention anything. And, and just surrender. Be free of that. Because there's going to be a constant struggle with the flesh and the spirit, but God is greater because he is in you. And the enemy and the world is out there. Amen? God bless you.